So the, the, it's like we're, we're getting into like, like some serious drama here. So um, on a parallel thread, I'd like met someone and they said like, if you come through Germany, you stop by. And I said, okay, well, on my way to India, I'm going I'm to stop by Daimler headquarters and, and, and talk to them um, and see if there's any kind of partnership that could be had. This, this is, I forget the exact, it, it, it's it's right before I gave the the IAC talk, it, so that like it would be, a, a, that's how one could place it. Um, and I and I met with uh, their engineering team, and I said like, is there anything you guys like? What do you guys want? want? Like, is there you know? I'm trying to play cool here, you know, uh, even though, like, we desperately need some kind of partnership or we're screwed. Um, and uh, and they said, well, they're thinking about an electric smart car. So I was like, hmm, okay, if we were to do something, you know, when, like, wh when would you want to see it? And I said, well, we've got like a, a delegation of Daimler executives coming through in January, January of 2009. Um, and I think this was October or something like that. And I talked to JB um, and, and like Drew and Scott and Vineet and a bunch of others. I was like, guys, we need to get a smart car, uh, and we need to uh, stuff a roadster powertrain into it uh, and make a custom battery, and it needs to work by the, by the time the Daimler team comes here in January. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. We can interview JB and about it, and maybe he could like add some additional color. So now, so the problem was that there were no smart cars uh, in, were not being sold in the U.S., but they were being sold in Mexico. So we sent someone to Mexico to just buy a smart car and drive across the border. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so we just we, so we this is like a gasoline smart car. So mm -hmm. just we, with Mexican plates. Um, <laughs> so we went and bought a, bought a smart car in Mexico, drove it across the border, and and then, and then literally put a roadster drive unit and modified battery pack in in the smart car and had it working uh, by January when the Daimler delegation came by. And I remember that being in that, in that down the meeting, and man, they were just, they were like, why? clearly they're, they're, they're quite grumpy that they even had to meet with us. They did not know we had this uh, electric smart car. So they're grumpy that, that they had to meet with us and were clearly trying to get out of the room as quickly as possible. Yeah. And, and when we, we started off, made the mistake of, of starting off with, with PowerPoint, and the, which immediately made them even grumpier because <laughs> everything works in PowerPoint and they've yeah. seen way too many PowerPoint slides. And they were like literally getting ready to, like they were gonna just walk out. Uh, from the PowerPoint presentation, I said, well, would you like to drive the car? They're like, well, what do you mean? It's like, well, we have an electric smart car. So you, do you want to drive it? Like, like, you don't have an electric smart car. That's impossible. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's just in the parking lot. You can go drive it. Actually, it, 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 it was a, like, not only was it a smart car, it was fucking sick. Like, <laughs> this thing had a roadster powertrain in a smart car. The power to weight ratio of this thing was bananas. It's like you could pull wheelies in a smart car. Literally, if you if could you step, fly? <laughs> yeah, you could lift the front wheels off the oh. the deck. Um, <laughs> yeah, a motorcycle torque on a four wheel vehicle. Yeah, a motorcycle torque on a four wheel vehicle. It was it was insane. You could burn rubber in a smart car. It, lo it looked bizarre. Like yeah. you just never seen a thing move like that. Um, <laughs> I might actually drive a smart car if it was like yeah, that. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> Anyway, so that we kind of we just blew their minds. Like they're like, "What? How? How? How is this? This is like, impo what impossible black magic can you figure it out to have like an electric smart car?" And it's like, "Well, we got one from Mexico three months ago, and we uh, put a roadster powertrain in it and and a modified battery pack, and you can still use the car. Like the inter in the interior of the car was still fully usable, so we didn't like uh, intrude on the interior space." Um, and and we're like, "Yeah, we can." And they're like, "Hmm, okay. Well, this is pretty impressive. Um, they never seen anything like this before." So so then they're like. Okay, well, they'll consider that they they will do a a some smart car uh, limited production. Like like part of this is because they like they had to make the regulators happy. So this was not like you know they needed like some you know sustainable energy cars to make the regulators happy. This was the, that was the reason for this electric smart car. Uh -huh. The fuel, the fleet miles. It, it, was, it was not a, it was not it was it was it was not a grand vision by Daimler to go electric. No. It was to get these annoying regulators off our back. Uh, <laughs> so for the so, credits, right? Yeah, there, there was like compliance. It's compliance, yeah. compliance vehicles. So it's like there was like a minimum number of electric vehicles that had to be made. Uh, they could also make fuel cell vehicles, but those were way more expensive. Yeah. So, so from from this standpoint, it was at the time, it was really more like 
what's the least amount of money we can spend mm -hmm. and get the regulators off our, the re regulator monkey off our back? <laughs> that, that, so like, uh, so, so just, anyway, so that, so, so we ended up making a bunch of electric smart cars for, for Daimler. Um, and, um, and, and then, uh, over time we actually ex ex extended that into an, like an electric AB class. Um, but, but they were always just really compliance vehicles. They did not want to make, Daimler was not willing to place at that time a big bet on electric vehicles. Mm. Um, mm. And, so, and, and so the volume and the price were always like, the volume's too low, the price is too high. This is, these are going to be niche vehicles no matter what. Um, and, um. But anyway, so what it did lead to, which was really essential, was Tesla uh, getting saved by Daimler investing $50 million. Mm -hmm. So the $40 million invested in December of 2008 just gave us six months of runway. So uh, that basically gave us until June of, of, of 2009. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, during this period, <laughs> General Motors is bankrupt, Chrysler is bankrupt. So... Not a lot of people are interested in investing in a startup car company, <laughs> let alone an electric car company. Yeah. And remember, this is back when electric was uh, synonymous with dumb. You could just say, yeah. <laughs> instead of using the word electric car company, you could just substitute dumb. Do you want to invest in a dumb car company? <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's what it sounded like to most people. Mm. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and so at the time, the uh, I think like Daimler was. I think Daimler vaguely thought that that um, the Volkswagen Group might invest in Tesla, and they didn't want that. So, uh, so, so they they were essentially to block VW from investing in, in Tesla. Which, by the way, VW was not going to invest in Tesla. I talked to their their, their their person, and they expressed some initial interest, but then they went dark on me. So, huh. uh, it, actually, only the only one, the only in, investor that was interested in Tesla at all was Daimler. Mm. Huh. Uh, and that was because of the, the electric smart program. Wow. Um, so they invested uh, fifty million dollars into Tesla um, at roughly a five hundred million dollar valuation. Hmm. So it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. Ten percent. Like yeah. yeah. They got ten percent of the company. Yeah. I mean, we're really, in, we're really in the in, in the in the weeds here. So hopefully, this is interesting to some people. Um, yeah. But this like we're, this is like definitely some like you know deep lore war war story stuff. Um, so, so, so then, it, um, in 2009, we're also just figuring out how to actually get the roads into into volume production. Yeah. So we were not able to reach volume production, for, even for the, by roadster standards in 2008. Um, and we still had uh, a, bu a bunch of things in the car that were. I think we managed to deliver like maybe 20 or 25 cars um, mm. in 2008, most of which were in December. Um, and then. We had to bring all of those cars back to have re uh, refl uh, have their, their drivetrains replaced, <laughs> <laughs> and I think most of them got their battery pack replaced too. So, uh, I mean, it was just a fumbling mess, basically. It was insane. But in two thousand nine, uh, is is when we actually figured out how to make the car half decent, uh, half decent roads for one, where you could give it to someone and it wouldn't just like break down immediately. Um, and like a roughly summer of 2009 is is when the the car wasn't uh, a complete piece of trash. That that just didn't work. <laughs> yeah. um, and then we did a roadster 1.5, and then uh, Franz joined, mm -hmm. uh, and Franz helped redesign the roadster and make it better mm -hmm. with the roadster two. Uh -huh. um, then by like basically. Late 2009, early 2010 is where the Roadster was like a, a, a decent, decent as a toy. Yeah. Uh, not not as like a you know transport you could count on, but as a toy, it was decent. Became decent around end of 2009, early 2010. Um. Anyway, so that so that that Daimler investment in May 2009 was what was essential to. Uh, Tesla survival, uh, not a government loans. So this is another thing that is a mis misunderstanding here, uh, because what they, they got confused between because uh, GM and Chrysler and Ford, uh, GM got a massive bailout, just like a flat out freaking donation from from taxpayers, like uh, of of tens of billions of dollars. So uh, 
GM got like uh, yeah, I don't know, thirty billion dollar handout basically with with no no repayment. Last I checked, there's over fourteen billion that's unpaid. Okay, so maybe it's yeah, a, it's, it's a real amount though. Okay, so yeah. fourteen uh, that has not been repaid and, and never will be, I suspect. So, um, and then Chrysler got a bunch of money, and then uh, and then Ford Ford got uh, like a five billion dollar loan. Um, but Ford is in better financial shape because I don't know for whatever reason. I think that Ford just the Ford family has more long term thinking than um, the people that were running uh, GM and Chrysler. So they were in a, a better financial position. Um, but it remains the case today that the only company American car companies that have not gone bankrupt are Tesla and Ford. Uh, and you know, it, 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 unless something changes significantly with Rivian and Lucid, they will both go bankrupt. They are tracking to bankruptcy. It, they may not. I'm um, saying like that, that is currently like if, if this was an airplane, they're like they're going like that. So if something happens to go, it's change. <laughs> okay, but currently the intersection with doom. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, I I hope they are able to do something, but unless they cut their costs dramatically, they are in deep trouble, um, and and will end up in the in the in the cemetery like every other car company, with the exception of Tesla and Ford. Uh, anyway, that Daimler investment was essential to Tesla's survival. Um, around that time, in mid two thousand nine, we got a letter, a, a sort of a uh, sort of a letter of interest, like a non binding letter of interest from the DOE for. A loan that I believe was around five hundred million dollars. Um, now that was not a loan where they just give you five hundred million dollars. That that was one where you spend the money, you provide invoices. Uh, those invoices are provided to DOE. They then uh, refund you based on the audited expenditure expenses that you you paid. And it's not like lump sum type of thing. It's retro. It's retroactive after you spend it. It's a reimbursement program. It's a, it's a reimbursement. It's, it's a re it's, it's a loan. Uh, yeah. A loan reimbursement. Yeah. So, so not not. It's, there's nothing. Nothing's given for free. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. It's a loan reimbursement. Um, so it's it's not. It, it would not be possible to use that as advanced capital to get make something happen. It can only mm -hmm. be used to reimburse you re reimburse expenses that have already taken place with yep. a two to three month lag. Um, and the first disperse that that that, did, that letter of interest did not become an actual uh, binding document until 2010. And then, and, and the first money that Tesla received uh, as a reimbursement from that, I think, was March or April of 2010, by which time the re the, the recession had passed. So, if we, if we had needed the money from that loan, Tesla would have gone bankrupt. Yeah. Um, so the, the the DOE loan, I think, was 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 helpful as an accelerant, but it was not a life or death thing for Tesla. Um, and, and ultimately, the, we, we, the, the constraints, the, 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 the problem is that the DOE was second guessing our business plan and, and our execution. So, there, so we're like, well, we need to change the business plan because if we keep going in that direction, we're going to die. So we're going to go in that direction and in the non-death direction. And then, then you're explaining to someone at the DOE why you're changing the plan. And then they're like, but the plan is different. You need to stay to the plan. Like, well, if we stay to the plan, we're going to crash. And and uh, the company will die, and that's why we want to change the plan. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the plan. <laughs> but that's the plan. And I'm like, okay, this is not good. Uh, <laughs> and, and and like you know, w w w with enough effort, we could actually get the DOE to agree to change the plan. But this was taking up a lot of bandwidth to you know to be constantly uh, ex convincing people at DOE that the new plan is better than the old plan. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, so after the uh, IPO in 2010, uh, uh, we, we paid back the DOE loan. Um, That's awesome. And and we actually had to pay a penalty. An early there was an early repayment penalty. So we paid back the loan with interest plus a prepayment penalty. Hmm. Like taxpayers made money on the loan. Very important. Yeah. Uh, taxpayers made money on the Tesla DOE loan. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, whereas they're still fourteen dollars down on, on on fourteen billion dollars down on, on on GM. So um, another thing worth pointing out is none of the incentives, uh, the EV incentives that exist, not one of them was obtained by Tesla, not one of them. The the the, the seventy five hundred dollar uh, uh, tax credit was General Motors. 
they're the one who got that. Like Tesla had no lobbying uh, uh, power in DC at all. Like the but GM had huge lobbying powers. They're, they're the ones that got the seventy five hundred dollar tax credit uh, put in place. Um, and and Nissan, uh, but we have basically no presence in DC. So. Um, Because, yeah, I mean, you'll certainly hear, like, oh, Tesla's Tesla and tax credits. I'm like, okay, well, currently we don't have, we, we, the $7,500 tax credit does not apply to Tesla, mm -hmm. but it does apply to our competitors. Mm -hmm. So anyone who has not made, any, any company that's accumulated production below 200,000 cars mm -hmm. has a $7,500 tax credit, and Tesla does not because we've, we've, we've long ago exceeded the 200,000 car maximum. So... Uh, we, t Tesla is at a competitive disadvantage with respect to tax credits. That is yeah. quite significant when you're talking about, like, say, a $40,000 car and a $7,500 tax credit. That's like a, almost a 20% difference. Mm -hmm. So big deal. Uh, so Tesla is successful currently in spite of our competitors having a, a materially greater tax advantages than, than Tesla. In spite of it, not because of it. If, if you eliminated all in, uh, EV incentives tomorrow, Tesla's competitive position would improve significantly. I'll say that again. If you eliminated all tax credits, EV tax credits, Tesla's position would improve immediately. And Tesla did the purpose what the tax credits were for, right? To drive that innovation ramp. You guys just actually did it so fast that the competitors are still using yeah. it. Yeah. Well, when we started Tesla, gas was two, under two bucks a gallon in California, and there were no tax credits. So it was not from the standpoint of like, hey, this is a a, a great opportunity. I mean, when we, when we started Tesla, I, I should be clear, like, the, with it was with an expectation of success of, of less than ten percent, and the same for SpaceX. Yeah. Uh, and who in their right mind would think that, that a car company would have anything more than a ten percent probability of success if you've never done, built a car in your entire life before? Uh, and uh, there have been guys. Yeah, there's only, there's, exactly, there's only, uh, at the time, you, you, you know, you had GM, uh, Ford and Chrysler, and, the, but, but the history of car companies is like, there have been like over a thousand car company startups in the United States, and they're all dead. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and, you know, with the 2008-2009 recession, uh, GM and Chrysler also went bankrupt. So, so then, the, the, you know, the, the chances of survival are extremely tiny. Uh, only, like only a fool would start a car company with with electric car company or a car company whatsoever, th and think that the probability of success was high. So, my initial thought for both Tesla and SpaceX was that I'd, I'd take half the money from from the pay from PayPal, and uh, I'd waste half of it on two ludicrous ventures: one being a car company and a rocket company, and that would be dumb, and, and I'd just lose it all, and that'd be. But I'd still have ninety million dollars left, so whatever, you know. And but in the end. I, I, I could, I, I, like I said, the companies were like children to me. So like, it was like, uh, so I gave the companies all the money that I had. And then I would have had no money at all if Tesla and, and SpaceX had, had, had not survived. I would have owed a lot of money and been personally bankrupt if, if Tesla and SpaceX had not survived. That hadn't happened, we still wouldn't have electric vehicles. Not, yeah, not like I think so. I, like Tesla, Tesla's, I mean, if you like, what is Tesla's fundamental value? It is to, it is to serve as an accelerant to sustainable energy. Um, and if, if you say like, uh, but for Tesla, uh, what would the world be like? Um, in, in, in ways that, like, let's say you're sort of, you're looking at this from, you know, the macroeconomic God standpoint or, or like a civilization or, you know, the Sims or something, you know, like what's the difference here? The difference b between Tesla and not Tesla is, by, is how many years uh, is sustainable energy accelerated? Mm -hmm. That is the fundamental good of Tesla. Yep. Yeah, um, and, and then there's there's also the autonomy thing, uh, which is, uh, I think, it also be very very significant. It, it will be very significant. But I'd say, like, in the absence of there being a fundamental technology discontinuity in the form of electrification and autonomy, both of them together, I think a new car company cannot succeed. So. Now I'll tell you, like, actually, the real reason that people should have been shorting Tesla, and perhaps why some of them were shorting Tesla, and the real reason that car companies, uh, new car companies, cannot succeed, or, or, or why it's very hard for them to succeed, um, and this was first told to me by 
this, uh, this automotive investor when I was at Axel Springer headquarters getting a Golden Steering Wheel Award. And this, this guy is who's apparently like the best automotive investor in the world, you know, comes up to me and like, he's like, hi, I know why you're going to fail. I'm like, well, please tell me. I can think of several reasons. Um, <laughs> <laughs> tell me when I don't but, know. <laughs> yes. And, and he said, the, he, he said that the car companies uh, don't make any money on the new car sales. They make all of their money selling used, uh, selling parts to cars to, to the existing fleet. Mm -hmm. So when, when the, the warranty runs out, like the life of a car before it hits the junkyard might be 20 years. Warranty is going to typically run out after four years, and there's a bunch of stuff that's not covered under warranty. So if you've got a, a steady state fleet, it means that 80% of your fleet is not under warranty. Mm. So you can sell high margin uh, parts, replacement parts, for the, for the existing fleet. Mm -hmm. and, and you can sell your new cars at effectively zero, zero margin. Mm. It's, like, it's like a razors and blades thing. Yeah. Yeah. So you sell, you sell the, the razor for zero margin, yep. and you sell the blades at high margin. Mm. So then this, this creates a, an, a massive barrier to entry for any new car company because you have no existing fleet. So, so the only way for a new car company to succeed is, is that does not have an existing fleet is to charge a lot more uh, for your car than what others are paying, than competitors. And in order to charge a lot more, have people actually buy it, the product must be so, so compelling uh, that people are willing to pay the premium above uh, the alternative mm -hmm. cars from, from the incumbent car makers. This is the only way. And I think without both electrification and autonomy, this does not succeed. So that is the only way to do it. You have to win on autonomy, and you have to win on electrification, and you have to make the product so compelling that uh, that it is worth paying the paying the uh, the premium relative to the the incumbent competitors. This is this is a very big deal. Yeah, very very big deal. Um, so, yeah. Why well, exactly that customer, by the way? What I, drove, I first drove, test drove a Tesla in 2015. The acceleration and all that was cool. The electric was cool. But when I tapped the stick for autopilot 1.0 and yeah. it locked on the rail, yep. on the road yeah. like rails, I went, holy shit, the future is here. And went from a $4,000 car to, at the time, a fully loaded Model S, opposite end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. That exact angle was it. And that's gotten so many people mm -hmm. that way. Yeah. No well, autopilot. I'm, I'm thinking, I probably still wouldn't be a Tesla owner. Yeah. Why exactly. Think... It, it, the thing that actually got me. Um, you know, because we've got to get a lot of flack for like autopilot deaths and stuff. Yeah. But, but let me tell you that, yeah, it's like no amount of statistics can convince people otherwise. They're like, you know. Uh, one time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the thing that, that actually got me to um, really get a move on with autopilot was that um, this, the, this, this anecdote illustrates several things, by the way. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I think this was this might have been like 2014 or something like that. Um, a Model S owner in the Bay Area fell asleep while driving his Model S uh, and ran over a cyclist and killed the cyclist. Mm. Um, now, if there had been even basic lane following, um, that cyclist would still be alive. So I was like, man, if if anything illustrates the importance of autopilot, it's it's this case here where that innocent cyclist would still be alive if if that guy that fell asleep had had uh, autopilot or any kind of like lane following even basic lane following it wouldn't the car would not have veered off the road and, and, and killed the cyclist mm -hmm. so I was like we, we got to get a move on here this is a real safety issue um, so that's part of what re really uh, you know encouraged me to like we need to go make this happen as, as quickly as possible um, uh, th th but there's more to the story. Um, the guy that uh, ran over the cyclist um, did not internalize responsibility for himself. Uh, he was, he said that the problem was he blamed it on Tesla, and 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 said he fell asleep because of the new car smell. <laughs> awesome. I'm not making this up. You can literally search the court records, and he got a lawyer. Okay, amazingly, got a lawyer to represent him and file a lawsuit against Tesla. <laughs> Saying it's not his fault he ran over the the, <laughs> the cyclist. It's because of the new car smell that put him to sleep. <laughs> now, obviously, when this got before the judge, the judge is like, "That's ridiculous. Case dismissed." Um, but uh, this just gives you some sense of both uh, the importance of autopilot um, and generally people's unwillingness to internalize responsibility. <laughs> <laughs>
Car smells. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he actually had the nerve to, to engage a lawyer and file a lawsuit, and you're like, "Wow, that's that's in the court records." Yeah. You're like, "Oh yeah, dude. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's you. I'm, you know, the judge like it's you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Take responsibility for your actions." So, anyway, um, but but the, yeah. So so that's why I think like unless. Um, some new car company uh, is able to solve autonomy and electrification and make a product that's extremely compelling and reach volume production uh, where with a, a cost of goods where, where the cost of the cost of the car is uh, low enough that you can charge a price where you don't exceed the affordability limit of, of people like the uh, a number of times I've had this conversation with with like rich investors on Wall Street is crazy because they um, there, there are two factors at play. One is uh, value for money. Uh, the other is uh, fundamental affordability. So, by um, these things are often conflated by by if somebody has is like uh, you know has tens of millions of dollars, lives in Wall Street, and and whatever they 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 don't understand that they just think about value for money. They don't think about affordability. Like all cars are affordable. If someone just literally does not have enough money money in the bank account, they cannot buy the car even if you rail desirability to infinite. Like, we'll just turn the desirability knob. This is the, this, this thing, you know, Car will stuff. transform into a jet and fly you to a private island that it will create by itself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, uh, you can make it so desirable uh, that it's, you can just make desirability infinite, but if, if it costs more than people can afford, they can't buy it no matter how great it is. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, that affordability threshold is very, very important. So it, it must both be good value for money and be affordable with, uh, in order to achieve the, the, the unit volumes. And where car companies can get, get kind of painted into a corner, the corner of doom, uh, is, is if, the, um, if, if the cost of the car is, is so high that they have to raise the price of the car to the point where the price of the car is, and Rivian, I think, has this, this problem, so, you know, that they either need to fix it or they're in deep trouble. Uh, they raise the price to the point where only a, a very small number of people can afford the car, no matter how desirable it is. Um, then, at, at that point, if you cannot achieve a unit volume that covers your fixed costs, you're, you're screwed. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, 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 Rivian need, it needs, my advice to Rivian too would be to cut costs immediately across the board dramatically. Uh, or, or they're doomed. Yeah. So, or this applies to any any car company. Really. Yeah. As, as you as you raise the price, you're, you're sort of the 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 percentage of of people who can afford the car starts to drop exponentially. Um, so, um, you know, like start start getting getting a car above a hundred thousand dollars. Very very few people can afford it, no matter how desirable it is. Uh, and then you, you've got it, but you've got to have enough unit volume to pay for um, to pay for fi your fixed overheads. So you basically you've got to you cover you've got to cover your operating expenses. Just check see if I. We can do a time check too if we need to. No, I'm just a friend of mine is like suggesting that I troll hard drive by posting more memes from them. <laughs> They're just going to keep stealing their memes and posting them without giving them any credit. <laughs> People love that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the whole point of a meme. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And typically, you like the, the meme too that you'll post, and so people know where it's coming from. Yeah. Memes belong to people. Yeah. <laughs> you create your own memes, though, don't you? Uh, so I saw you create some memes. Um, your, your meme king is strong. Thank you. Yeah. Who controls the <laughs> memes? Control the oh, my friend memes. is saying I should post hard drive memes and de and declare that I made it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I made it myself. <laughs> and, 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 and then tell hard drive to stop copying me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, maybe one day uh, I don't have an AI will figure out how to copy them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might be scary. He's actually. so vexed. Um, so yeah, um, you good on time too? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, 
I'm, I'm okay. This I'm just getting little text buzzes, so. Um, but the, the, nothing is like the house, you know, something's on fire, which by the way, so, sometimes I do get the text. <laughs> house is on fire? <laughs> the, the house is on fire, the car is on fire, the dumpster's on fire. Oh, yeah. Number, number, we've, we've had a lot of dumpster fires to Tesla, actually. I've heard. What's going, what's going on in Fremont? It seems like a lot of I've fires heard, there. Of, yeah, my friends there keep texting me every time. But there's a dumpster, dumpster yeah. fire. There literal dumpster fire. fire. Yeah. It's like yeah. not a yeah. metaphorical yeah. dumpster <laughs> fire. It's literally yeah. a dumpster <laughs> on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine the, you see the, the beam of the dumpster on fire floating down the river in, the, yeah. in Alabama. <laughs> I mean, things like if, if you have like a lot of uh, cardboard and wood packaging um, in, in a dumpster, then or whatever, it's gonna th th like if it's flammable. It's you know, then somebody I don't know. Sometimes I think some of these things are some kids having fun or whatever, just like uh, being arsonists, and and some of it are just you know, I, I don't know where how these things like trying to figure out like, why is this dumpster on fire? I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's on fire clearly, but why did how the fire start? I don't know. Nobody knows how the fire started. <laughs> They're like dumpster fires are actually not that dangerous, but they're like, a, 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 <laughs> you know, unless it's indoors or something. But uh, like an out, an outdoor dumpster fire is not intrinsically dangerous. It's contained. Yeah. It's contained. It's like it's, the dumpster's not going to melt or anything. Yeah. Uh, so it tends to just be like, it just gener it creates drama, but it's not like actually dangerous. So currently we get to give, we've all been FSC beta, you guys, thank, thank you by the way, it's been fun. Yeah, like, thank you. testing that. Um, <laughs> Recently got kicked out, but. <laughs> well, on low, 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 just, these long, really long road trips, I, I just made, it's yeah. made, it's I was on, on a really, long drive to San Francisco, really and unfortunately. Long, on really long road trips, I have this problem where I'll get the nag thing will give me enough times and I'll disable, and you know, I did like 800 miles across Texas and I'll get tired of it. That's actually not what it's about. Uh, we currently get to give feedback for when the car does something wrong. Would it be useful if we got to give feedback when the car did something like really well and really right? Because I have to do great things all the time, but I have no yeah. way to like call somebody or mark the video and yeah. say, "Hey, they did this turn incredibly and it's faced well." And like, is there? I mean, like, because I'm assuming the AI is being treated trained with reinforcement learning as well. It'd be great if we could help give that feedback when the car is like, "Great job, buddy!" Like the plus one button or something. I don't know. Um, all input is error. Yeah, all input is error, exactly. Unless unless, the, unless somebody missed the future, in which case, no input is error. Like, in some cases, we've got, like, cool features nobody ever used or knew was there, like the, uh, you know, um, Wizards in Winter Dance with the Model X doors. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's rare to encounter a customer who actually knows about that. Most of them know it doesn't, don't know it exists. Right. And then we made it, like, too hard to, to do. And it should be the opposite of an Easter egg. It should be, like, mac this maximized number of people who know about it, not, like, minimize it. Sorry, I worked with Tesla. I actually shot the video. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, great. <laughs> I tried. I tried to get it out <laughs> I, Yeah, I think, like, people didn't translate that to my car can also do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. Um, but uh, still today, I bet, I bet the mo probably, I don't know, more, at least two thirds of Model X owners have no idea the car can do that. You're not um, talking about the Christmas dance, are you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's like such. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So obvious to you, but you know, yeah. It's like, so Most people look. My neighbors I know. Me to move. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> right. Like it's great. I <laughs> but I mean, you know, people have never seen a car do anything like that. So no, it's uh, radical. Yeah. 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 Do you so, have Do you have like a favorite Easter egg or, or feature that you've put into the cars that? Yeah, is this just your favorite? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I suppose that the sort of Wizards, Wizards and Winter door dance is yeah. my favorite, uh, you know, sort of Easter eggy feature or, or yeah. fun thing that awesome. has no value in and of itself. Uh, <laughs> of course it does. Entertainment. Yeah, it's like it's, enter it. <laughs> it's entertainment, but it's like, yeah. uh, you know, it's not, it's like an unnecessary <laughs> thing that's cool. Um, yeah. I mean, there was the, uh, you know, T tap uh, autopilot four times uh, to play uh, new, uh, more, more cowbell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, like people would get, get, but now that's the one that you could accidentally do, and then and, and then it would, and then your screen turns to uh, like Mario Kart uh, <laughs> Road. Rainbow Road. Yeah, yep. and. Down or off? Yeah. Kids can't be sleeping during that time. <laughs> yeah. Santa yeah. Santa I think I think it's a few, a few, a quite a few times people have accidentally because it's like it's, it is a thing you could just tap too many times. Yep. It's like yeah. it's not one of those Easter eggs. You know, it's like one of those like old, old school arcade games where it's like up, up, down, down, left, left, right. Like you know, it's like just press it four <laughs> times and bingo. 
Uh, so I think a lot of people just <laughs> accidentally like, what happened? <laughs> Am I going crazy? Why is the car doing this? <laughs> My grandma uh, lost it. Yeah. Um, so that, that's a cool one. Um, you, know, you can change the car to standard 42. Car's name changed life, the universe, and everything. Um, there's uh, the James Bond, where it turns into the Spy Loved Me car. That's a submarine car, basically. Yeah, yep. Um, Is there any undiscovered yeah. Easter eggs? Personal opponent and it changes to Thomas Edison. Is that my coordinate right? Uh, maybe actually. I'm not. Uh, so. There's 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 a ha 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 if you want to change the uh, screen for, to reindeer. Ha ha ha, not funny. Ha ha, not funny. We'll we'll play the song. Grandma got run over with a reindeer. <laughs> <laughs> Grandma got run over by a reindeer. Is the ha ha not funny? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> 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 is there yeah. any undiscovered Easter eggs in production right now? I mean, there might be. Like, I don't. They don't necessarily tell me about all the Easter eggs, you know. But I mean, the thing is that, uh, like, we, we can't spend too much time on Easter eggs because we, we should be. <laughs> Come uh, on, that should be the, the entire focus. <laughs> well, the, the problem is, if, if if something is rare, like what you're really trying to do is maximize the area under the curve of yeah. number of people times degree of enjoyment. Yeah. So, like, it's fine to have like like a you know, a low effort Easter egg that is something that like a small number of people will get a lot of joy from and then you like area out of the curve of like, well, they got a lot of joy and it's, but it's a small number of people. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the what you're really looking for is something that would uh, provide a lot of people enjoyment um, and uh, maximize the area out of the curve of total total people times amount of an average enjoyment. Yeah. That, that's, the, that's what you're actually trying to do, if, yeah. you know. So that's why you can't get carried away with the Easter egg stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you really want everyone to experience it, not 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 make it some extremely you know point oh one percent of people actually even know it exists situation. Yeah. Um, so um, I think we've got a lot of work to do actually with the with the basic software in the car. Like our web browser sucks, and um, we we definitely need to do work on the overall interface in the car. We're, like you know, there's yeah. a lot of complaints on the interface. I think yeah. we do better on the interface. Uh, but like, if you try to use the web browser in the car, it like takes a long time to load, yeah. and that's a trash browser. Yeah. Uh, it's it's worse than like some you know, iPad from five years ago, like by a lot. <laughs> um, and um, like the rear the rear screen and the SNX, the controls need a lot of work. Um, but but it, like it can be quite helpful for like entertaining your yeah. like ha having like your kids now have something to watch in the back. Yep. Yeah. Um, and you can put like YouTube stuff Game on. Changer. It's a game, yeah, if you play that, it's a game changer. <laughs> it is a game changer. But like, for, for example, like, like that's something where we could, um, uh, we, we should have separate audio for the back. And yep. like, like, yeah. there's, what's the point of, of like, currently we, we play the same uh, audio level for the for that back screen in the mm -hmm. front as in the back. Yeah. Like, it should just play the the back should play that audio, or it should like route to a Bluetooth that's keyed off of yep. the rear screen, mm -hmm. and then you give them headphones or something. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so that people can listen to music in the front and not get blasted by yeah. the YouTube kid show audio in the front, which exactly. is currently the situation. That's correct. Uh, so there's like a bunch of stuff like that that we need to fix. Um, but the 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 but the overwhelming focus is is solving full self driving. So um, yeah, well, and th that that's essential. And like that's really the difference between Tesla uh, being worth a lot of money and being worth basically zero. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. one question I was going to ask with a little maybe a lot, uh, remaining time would do. You, is there any additional questions or fud or misinformation about Tesla, or I don't know, maybe you want to walk around the factory or whatever you have time for. It's kind of quiet, so but whatever, whatever you have time for, we're we're game for. Um, well, I mean, is there anything we should go over that would be helpful? I mean, I think some some of these things are like just. Uh, like the whole founder thing is like, yeah. it's like it, it's like I think fundamentally like even a sort of like kind of a stupid question because what does it mean to found something? You know, yep. the, there's there's some critical mass of uh, inspiration and perspiration, but it's a ne it's an, a nebulous number or, or it's a ne nebulous metric to say, uh, you know, who, who, this person deserves to be a co-founder, this one doesn't. Mm -hmm. it's, it's nebulous, um, but I think if you you could apply the but for 
uh, question. Like, but for this person, would the company exist? Or, or would, it, would it have gone bankrupt or not exist in a, in, in a form that it is currently, uh, or in a, in a much diminished form or simply not exist at all? And the only two people that you could apply the but for argument to um, are uh, J.B. Straubel and me. Mm. But for J.B. Straubel and me, Tesla would, would, I would, I think, never have existed in any meaningful way. And if it had, it would have gone bankrupt. So that's those are the only two people that the bit for argument applies. Maybe you want to go into this here or not. Um, you mentioned, I think, on Twitter very recently about the cold shoulder Tesla and SpaceX and stuff has, has experienced and the broader, you know, economic and political climate. Do you want to share more about how and how that's been affecting the things? Take this question. I got it. How you see that changing as you know Tesla expands in the Great Lone Star State? Uh, sure. So. Um, I mean, those that follow closely are aware of it. I think you're probably aware of it. So, somewhat of a rhetorical question, I suspect. But um, the uh, I think the general public is not aware of the degree to which unions control the Democratic Party. Um, uh, this is uh, one does not need to speculate on this point. Uh, last year, uh, President Biden uh, held an EV summit uh, where Tesla was explicitly not allowed to come, but the UAW was. So now Tesla's made uh, two thirds of all electric vehicles in the United States. So deliberately excluding us from an EV summit at the White House, but including the UAW, that tells you all you, know, all you need to know. Uh, the, the, the reality is the UAW would prefer that Tesla was dead or unionized, but not anything but alive and unionized. And there are no fans of sustainable energy. They have for sustainable energy the entire way. So now at, at, at Tesla, far from, uh, like Tesla pay, has the highest pay in the auto industry. Uh, and uh, moreover, the, the people that work at our Fremont plant have like, you know, five job offers to work somewhere else. There's negative unemployment in the Bay Area. Like try hiring someone in the Bay Area. It's ridiculous. It's negative unemployment. So uh, our challenge is how do we convince people to stay given the many other opportunities that they have, let alone a union. Like, they're like, what, we don't need a union? I've got five other jobs. That's the real reason. Uh, it's the, the complete opposite for, for what, what they're characterizing. And the UAW has never been able to get even uh, enough people to, to do a vote, let alone get to 50%. And California is an extremely pro-union state. There's nothing you can do to stop a union if they want to come in. Is it, there, it's like the California will roll out the red carpet. <laughs> so. Um, so then the, the UAW is, like, is basically forced to engage in like dirty tricks and, and de attempt to demonize the, me and anyone else associated with the, the company. It's like if the company's like, basically if the company's run by, by so, someone who's perceived to be good, then they have trouble unionizing because there's no, they're like, well, he's a good guy, why would, he, why would you want to unionize that company? So they have to make me, make me evil somehow. And so I, I do not, I, I, as you can tell, I don't like the UAW because uh, they have, run a dirty tricks campaign on me since at least 2017. Basically the point at which they, they thought maybe Tesla wasn't going to go bankrupt. Because while they thought Tesla was going to go bankrupt, they, there was no point in dirty tricks. Uh, when they thought Tesla might not go bankrupt, that's when the, the dirty tricks and the sort of smear campaign started. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of them. Now their, their attacks uh, did lose a bit of the wind in the sails when the uh, president of the UAW was sent to prison. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that, that took a little wind out of that took a little wind out of their sails, um, and then when the the next UAW president, who was supposed to be the person who would clean things up, when he was sent to prison, also that also took some more wind out of their sails, um, and um, but since then they 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 you know, recently in the last several months they they've sort of back to their 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 old tricks, so. And I mean, they, they have so much power over the White House that they can exclude Tesla from an EV summit. It's insane. Insane. Uh, and, and, and just in case, in case the first thing, in case that wasn't enough, then you, <laughs> then you have uh, President Biden with Mary Barra at a subsequent event yeah. uh, congratulating uh, Mary for having led the EV revolution. Uh, uh, this is 26 EVs in Q4 of last exactly, year. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. This is it. In, in, I, Mary believe, led. I believe it was in the same quarter that GM delivered 26 yes. electric vehicles, right. and Tesla delivered 300,000. 
it's, it's like not twenty six thousand, twenty six. <laughs> this is not. Uh, this is what they what the, what they said. <laughs> like it's not us saying, oh, oh, you're you're artificially saying their number is low. No, that's what they put in their earnings report. Okay, <laughs> we're just reading it. Yeah. So like that's like some next level insanity. Yeah. So. I think mean, so. It's it's not like it's not like a, a sort of a conspiracy theory. It's just like it's just just observe what like if if anyone is a remotely impartial observer, just observe the actions, and what other conclusion could you could you could you come to? Then uh, the, the current Democratic Party does not support Tesla because it is not unionized. They would rather Tesla was dead uh, than 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 be alive and non-unionized. So, and I think the pressure on this will increase over time. So, the, the more Tesla is successful, the more Tesla is an existential threat to the UAW. Mm. Mm. And so, this, the, the more pressure they'll put on the people that they got, they got elected to do, do harm to Tesla. Mm. How's reception been of Tesla moving into Texas? I mean, it's, it's been good. Like, uh, um, I mean, the thing about building the factory here, uh, that's I think should be noted, is that we built the factory here in less time than it would have taken to get the permits in California. Mm -hmm. So the, the typical permit permitting time for a green field in, in California is two years. Um, two years and you're gonna get sued by, if, uh, it's, you're just gonna get sued because <laughs> you're in California. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, we didn't get any lawsuits here, and we got the factory built in eighteen months. It's insane. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Since seeing the factory come online, okay. when I've flown here. I'll get people in the airport be like, "Oh, do you work at Tesla?" They are so excited. That's the general yeah. sentiment I've seen. Had a guy um, while driving down to see Starbase stop me. He's an oil man, but he was like, "My goodness, if this is what they're doing with the rockets, their cars have got to be amazing too." I think it's working, at least for yeah. the people on the side of the yeah. people. It's, it's like, I love living in California, but the problem is you cannot get things done. Um, yeah. So it's like, that, that's what I mean by like, I don't, I, this is not like, this is simply a description of fact. And ask anyone, and anyone who's done a large project in California, uh, how long would it take you to get the approval to proceed and pass CEQA in California for a large project? Oh, two, two years and you're doing well if you do it in two years. Um, and, and you're going to get a, a ton of people going to sue you just, just for the hell of it, basically. Um, and like I said, we got this built in 18 months. Less time than it would take, take to get the permit done in California. And when you go back to the fundamental good of Tesla is to what degree are we accelerating uh, sustainable energy, mm -hmm. it matters if we get it done now or in two years. That explains a lot, actually. I yeah. Didn't, I didn't think, yeah. So, so we therefore have a choice. Yeah. Uh, do we get a factory in California and delay uh, progress by two years? Or yeah. uh, accelerate by two years and do it in Texas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the, the morally right thing to do? Obviously, Texas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, and unless so like this, California is going to need like a crisis to have uh, to have deregulation um, yeah. and, and delitigation. Um, it's just the because there are there the the two. Entities that most control the Democratic Party are the unions, and secondarily, the the, the plaintiff bar, the lawyers, the the plaintiffs bar on, on the law side. They're basically the lawyers that that, that sue, mm -hmm. um, especially class action. That's who controls the Democratic Party. Uh, anyone who's who's familiar with inside baseball of this is will is, is, will agree with me. This is in fact the case, especially in California. So the issue is that the, the lawyers write the legislation to make it easy to win lawsuits in California because they, they, so they, they funded the election of the officials, of, of the, the, the people that got elected, got funded by Democrats and lawyers. So then they write the legislation to make it easy to win lawsuits and, and get gigantic awards because they got the people elected. And you have this sort of <laughs> circle of not, this nightmarish circle mm -hmm. until there has to be an above zero percent chance of a Republican getting elected in California. It has to be above zero percent. Otherwise, you have a one-party state. Mm -hmm. Consequences action. Yes, and, and then the, the, the political parties are irrelevant, and it's just the primaries. So that, that's the situation in California. It, and, and unless there's a crisis, 
I don't see, I don't see, like, I, one possible solution is like more open primaries. Like more open primaries, I think, would, would, would reduce the probability of, uh, of special interests uh, manipulating the election. Um, I, I, feel, I think like in, in LA, the, like the, the mayoral election is, is open primaries or sort of open primaries. It's like, it looks like, like maybe Rick Caruso will, will get, get elected. And he's like, I think it'd be great, you know. And, uh, but, but for the most part, it, it, California is, it's, it's gerrymandered to, to hell and gone uh, and to, to ensure a majority uh, Democrat uh, outcome. Generally speaking, everything you do is for humanity. Why? Why are we working? Why do you care about the politics? Why do you care about multi-planetary species? Consciousness, you mentioned that, but like, yeah. do, do you ever get, like, feel like that's maybe not the case or not true? Um, well, I mean, there's certainly at times when I, you know, have doubts about these things. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think it's a good question you ask because it goes to like what it, at a foundational level, what is my philosophy, and why does it lead to this conclusion? Yes. Um, so the the reason is that when I was uh, a teenager, I had like an existential crisis to try to figure out what's the meaning of life. Uh, it doesn't seem to be any meaning um, for me, at least. The religious texts, and I read all of them that I get my hands on did not seem convincing. Um, so then I'm like, okay. Then I started reading the philosophers. Um, get, you know, be careful of like reading German philosophers as a teenager. It's definitely not going to help with your <laughs> depression. <laughs> so reading Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, I'm like, oh. now, as an adult, it's much more manageable. But uh, as a kid, you're like, whoa. Um, so, so then I was like, man, I, I'm just like struggling to find meaning in life here. And, and then I read uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And basically what Douglas Adams was saying is that we don't really know what the right questions are to ask. Like the question is not uh, what's the meaning of life. Um, you know, uh, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, in the, <laughs> to Earth, Earth, it turns out, is a big computer. That's, and, and its goal is to... Uh, answer the question, what's the meaning of life? And, and Earth comes up with the answer 42. Uh, this is where the 42 number comes from. Okay. Uh, and 420 is just 10 times 42. Well, yeah. Uh, so, um, so what, so, uh, the, in, in that book, with it, which is really sort of a book about, it's an existential philosophy book uh, disguised as, as humor, um, uh, they, they come to the conclusion that no, the, uh, the real problem is is trying trying to formulate the, the question. So, and and to really have the right question, you need a much bigger computer than Earth. Um, and so, maybe I'd like one way of, I think way of, of characterizing this review say the <clears throat> the universe is the answer. What is the question? And the, the more, or what are the questions? Uh, the more we can expand the scope and scale of consciousness, the better we can understand what questions to ask about the answer that is the universe. And, and the, the more we can expand consciousness, uh, become a multi planet species, ultimately a multi cellar species, we have a chance of figuring out what the hell's going on. And so, and this this is this is why I think we should have more humans and 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 more digital both both biological and digital consciousness, um, and why we should become a multi planet species and a multi stellar species, is so that we can understand the nature of the universe. And then, in in order for that to occur, then we have to make sure that things are good on Earth. Um, we don't want Earth to, to disappear, uh, so. Sustainable energy is important for ensuring the long-term viability of Earth. Um, and making life multiplanetary is important for extending consciousness. Um, 
and, and ultimately we want to go and visit other star systems to see if there are alien civilizations there that perhaps still exist or perhaps died out millions of years ago. Um, the, the extraordinarily short, and people I think don't realize just how short civilization, how, like it's, it's so, like, so the first writings were only about 5,000 years ago. So I don't know what happened around 5,000 years ago, but for whatever reason, there's not really writings before that. So not, not some, there's not like some coherent symbolic representation um, before about 5,000, maybe 5,500 years ago. So you can call, like, if you date civilization from the point at which we had uh, writing, it's only 5,000 years old. Um, Earth has been around for, I don't know, four and a half billion years, five billion-ish. Um, the universe has been around for 13.8 billion years. Um, there were, like, shellfish, basically, 500 million years ago. So basically, what I'm saying is civilization has existed for uh, an instant, it, for, from, a, from, a, mm -hmm. from a sort of a galactic time scale frame of reference, uh, civilization at 5,000 years is, pra is basically flash in the pan. So, and if you look at the history of civilizations, which I encourage people to read the history of civilizations. In fact, there's literally a book called the, Hist the story of civilization. It's quite good. Um, and it, there's, there's been the rise and fall of many civilizations over the last 5,000 years. Um, and if you look at, say, the, the Egyptian, so ancient Egyptian civilization, which is one of the first writings, not the first, but, the, but close to the first. Um, you know, they built these incredible pyramids and had this sophisticated writing system. And then and then the, the people living in the area past a certain point, uh, I don't know, maybe around 1,500 years ago, the, the last person who could read hieroglyphics died. I think so, probably 1,500 to almost 2,000 years ago. That's the, they, uh, and, the, and well before that, the last people who could build pyramids died. And then, and then basically people were living next to these structures with that they just didn't know where they came from and with funny symbols written on them. And it, was, it took like Napoleon invading Egypt and bringing a bunch of scholars with him uh, and, and then the Rosetta Stone, but much more than the Rosetta Stone ultimately to decipher hieroglyphics. It's quite a difficult thing to decipher. So, I'm just saying, like that's that's a civilization that had a really good run. Mm -hmm. The I mean, the ancient Egyptians had like a 2,500 year run ish. Um, that's a very long time. You know, like ten times longer than the United States has been a country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but still, they died out. The ancient Sumerians died out. Um, they were arguably the first, like from an archaeological standpoint, the first uh, evidence of writing is the ancient Sumerian. Yeah. Um, they even found like school books and stuff, uh, like clay school books with like Great. teachers' corrections and stuff. <laughs> so it's just like basically civilization has existed for a, for a split second is, is really what it amounts to. So. Um, I think it's very important that we become a multi-planet species while we can and before uh, technology potentially subsides below the level where it's possible. Like, we're like, we, we, like one of the possible scenarios, and, and I think possibly even a probable scenario, is that our tech level actually drops, like just like the ancient Egyptians, just like every civilization which has gone through... Uh, you know, you know, has gone sort of on a, on a sine wave, but ultimately a downward sloping sine wave. So, you know, just like the, the, the Egyptians living in Egypt forgot how to build pyramids and read hieroglyphics. Um, we may forget to, how to build spaceships. 
And so we should build the spaceships and make life multiplanetary while it is possible. And if there were to be a World War Three, which is not zero probability, um, <laughs> looking at recent events, <laughs> yeah. um, what will be left after that? Hmm. Will there even be, I mean, will there, will there be, uh, but who, who's to say what technology would be left after World War III situation? Mm. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. Should be noted that Russia still has enough nukes uh, pointed at the United States to make every major city, uh, to make the radioactive rubble bounce several times in every major American city currently. It's not a small number. Several thousand. You've seen Battlestar Galactica, I presume, right? Yeah. Do you think that's? Do you think this has all happened before? <laughs> no, not on Earth, anyway. I mean, archaeologists uh, are really trying hard to find anything interesting, you know. So if you found evidence of an advanced alien civilization, you'd be like the number one hero in the entire archaeological profession, you know. It's so, like they're trying very hard to find these things. We don't find anything. So. And people sometimes ask me, have I seen evidence of aliens? I'm like, I have not. Um, and frankly, if, if I had seen ev evidence of aliens, I'd be like, hey guys, we found ev evidence of aliens. Everyone give SpaceX less more money because we, we need to improve our rocket technology. Otherwise, these aliens are going to get us. <laughs> I thought you were the alien. <laughs> yeah. I was an alien until I, you know, got U.S. citizenship. <laughs> that's, that's an alien registration card, it said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think funds rocket development like a war, so. Yeah, if it exactly. Aliens. Yeah, totally. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if, if, and like if, if the DoD had evidence of aliens, that I mean, immediately trot them out and say, danger, aliens, uh, give us more money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and everybody like, absolutely, that's not, that's, these aliens may not be friendly, you know, so. The best of my knowledge, there's no evidence of aliens. So, um, but anyway, like going back to the philosophy part, it's like uh, if you accept as a proposition that we don't really understand the meaning of life and we wish to understand the meaning of life, then in order to understand the meaning of life, we should expand consciousness such that we can ask better questions, learn more, uh, ex expand beyond the solar system, uh, ensure that. Uh, life on Earth is good, uh, for, for collectively for civilization, and um, and then we can be less dumb about the nature of the universe, and maybe we can answer some questions about how, where this all came from and where it's going. I think that's a sound philosophy. It's the least unsound philosophy I can think of. <laughs>